Mossad, one of the most effective secret services in the world. Its job, to prevent another Holocaust. You cannot have a true reading of the history of Israel, the history of the whole world, without understanding the secret history of its intelligence services. Mossad licensed a spy to manipulate and to kill. A Hezbollah commander was killed in a bomb attack. Assassination of a leading Iranian nuclear scientist. Mossad impacts global politics with spectacular operations. Mossad has been involved in every major incident in this region for the past 50 years. Mossad, feared, powerful, controversial. In the early 1980s, the situation along Israel's northern border escalates. Assassins from Palestinian refugee camps in southern Lebanon increasingly infiltrate Israeli territory. Mossad tries to hunt down the top terrorists, but it's powerless in the camps. After the PLO was chased out of Jordan in 1970, it set up its headquarters in Lebanon. Thousands of Palestinians have been permanently living here in refugee camps since Israeli independence. Terrorists have established bases, especially in the south. Israel's military strikes on those bases haven't solved the problem, but have merely provoked continued terrorist retaliation. Not even a ceasefire with the PLO can stop the bloodshed. More radical forces now set the agenda, ignoring the PLO's official policy. Israel's government is bent on an all-out effort to counter the terror on the northern border. Prime Minister Menachem Begin himself once carried out bloody assaults for Israel's independence. He finds his perfect partner in Ariel Sharon, defense minister since 1981. He wants to purge the PLO from Lebanon with a military strike. But Israel cannot simply invade a foreign country. Its leaders embark on a policy of deliberate provocation. Sharon is looking for an excuse to invade Lebanon, to be, get rid of the PLO, expel the PLO, and the belief being that if you get rid of the PLO as a symbol of Palestinian nationalism, then Israel will more or less have a free hand to do what it wants in terms of the West Bank. Most of the Palestinian refugees hope to return to their old homeland. The PLO under Yasser Arafat has become a powerful political factor in Lebanon, running the camps almost like a state within a state. Begin and Sharon are determined to put an end to this. Their logical allies in the fight against the PLO are Lebanon's Christians. Mossad maintains close contacts with them, since the Palestinians are their mutual enemy. The Christian militia have been fighting against the PLO in a civil war since 1975. The situation in Lebanon is complex. Various religious groups contend for power with massive foreign support. Israel supports the Christians, Iran supports the Shiites, and Syria intervenes with its military alongside the PLO. The Palestinians set up roadblocks. They identified Christians by their names and executed them. And the Christians did the same, sometimes without an ID. They held up a tomato. The Palestinians call it Bandura, and the Lebanese call it Banadura. 
When somebody said Bandora, they shot him. Beirut was the Wild West. Inside Mossad, there are doubts about the Christian militia's reliability, but supporting them seems to be the only means to influence events in Lebanon. In a letter to the head of military intelligence, I suggested that we help Christian groups in Beirut, based on the principle of my enemy's enemy is my friend. I went over a number of alternatives when I recommended helping the Christians in Lebanon, and none of them included the Israeli army physically entering Lebanon or cleaning out Beirut. The time is 10.53. Israeli armored units entered 50 minutes ago, marking the beginning of the operation. No one can foretell how a military operation will develop. Mossad had discouraged an Israeli intervention in the civil war, given that the situation in Lebanon was too complicated. But Ariel Sharon has great plans. At first, there's merely talk about attacking PLO bases along the border. But the real goal is to destroy the PLO's infrastructure all over Lebanon and to expel the Syrians. After that, a pro-Israeli regime is to be installed. Two months after the invasion, the PLO actually retreats from Lebanon. Sharon's strategy seems to work. The leader of the Christians, Bashir Jumayel, becomes Lebanon's new president, a man with good contacts to Israel and to Mossad. But Jumayel is killed in September 1982 in a bomb attack, probably carried out by Syria's secret service. His followers want revenge. I was at headquarters that day. The people from Mossad's political department were there with the men from the Christian militia. I saw them sitting there, getting out their knives. Believing that the PLO had killed Jumayel, the Christian militia attacks two Palestinian camps. Several hundred civilians are murdered. I'm not a bloodthirsty person. I don't like it when innocent civilians are killed, women and children. But that was a common occurrence during the war in Lebanon. Lebanon is once again sliding into civil war. Mossad has overestimated the Christians. They're unable to stay in power. Israel's intervention fails to put out the fire in the neighboring country, but continues to fuel it. They simply fail to fully appreciate the way that demographic shifts within Lebanon had altered the dispensation of power between the various confessions or the various communities. And I think it allowed Israel to get dragged into the Lebanese quagmire to an extent that it, it, it simply was not prepared for. The failure in Lebanon forces Minister Sharon and Prime Minister Begin to resign. Mossad too comes in for criticism. Although its experts originally discouraged an invasion, they're held responsible for having misjudged the situation. The policymakers in Israel had fairly strong political imperatives that would overrule anything that the people in the intelligence services may have warned them about. There was certainly a felt political pressure by the political leaders to do something and do something forceful. We've had the similar sorts of situations here in the United States. And of course, the, the big obvious one is uh, the Iraq war in 2003, following on the heels of the 9-11 terrorist attack in 2001, politicizing and selectively using intelligence. Politicians and their secret service are at loggerheads. Who is to direct whom? As always in a case of failure, no one wants to take the blame. 
The big question is, can a Mossad director influence a prime minister's decision-making process in strategic geopolitical matters? In my opinion, the answer is no. A prime minister has a much broader set of factors to deal with. The ideology he came up in, his political maneuvering, ensuring his political longevity. Mossad, a mere service provider, or a major player that controls information and pursues its own secret strategy. Mossad's real power becomes conspicuous in East Africa. A Jewish community has been living in Ethiopia since biblical times. In the early 1980s, tens of thousands are increasingly at risk of violence and hunger. Mossad is expected to bring the Ethiopian Jews to Israel, as decided by Prime Minister Menachem Begin in the late 70s. At the instigation of the Secret Service, thousands fled to refugee camps in neighboring Sudan, where they now await their rescue. It has to be carried out in secret, since the Arab-born dictator of Sudan, Jaffa al-Numiri, sees himself as Israel's enemy. Israeli intelligence is not in charge only on the safety of Israel, but also, also on the safety of the Jews. Even if they are not Israeli citizens, there is no other example in the world that an intelligence organization is in charge of citizens of another country because they come from the same religion. This is part of what makes us unique. This is what makes Israeli intelligence unique. Dramatic rescue operations are part of Mossad's founding myth. Hundreds of thousands are brought to Israel. In its first four years of existence, the country doubles its population. After World War II, European Jews are smuggled past the British mandate into Palestine. After the proclamation of Israel, Mossad is tasked with extracting Jewish communities from Arab countries into the land of their forefathers. Thirty years later, Mossad is looking for ways to bring the Ethiopian Jews to Israel. That operation involved breaking every rule in the book on how to run a clandestine operation. First of all, it took place in an area where we had very limited reconnaissance capabilities. We had no real way of knowing whether or not our people might have been exposed. A holiday resort on the Sudanese coast becomes the starting point for the secret rescue mission. No one in Sudan's diving paradise will be surprised to see Caucasians working in the tourist branch, a daring but perfect disguise for the Mossad agents. The people we recruited, well, we didn't have time to train them properly and prepare them for the job. However, I made the decision and we took a shortcut. We took some people, some of them Israelis, and gave them crash courses on operating under an assumed identity in a hostile country. Disguised as European and American resort staff, the Mossad agents live undetected for years in Sudan. They successfully manage the diving resort. Travel guidebooks are full of praise for them. During the day, they take care of the resort's guests. At night, they smuggle Jews out of the country. I was co-founder and manager of the resort. In Israel, Gad Shimron is a journalist and a Mossad agent. Among other things, I was a windsurfing instructor, a boat operator. We even brought the first windsurfing board into Sudan. We had it flown in from Israel on a military plane. With time, life in the diving paradise becomes routine. The agents have a casual relationship with the tourists. 
Yet more than once, they end up in tricky situations that endanger their cover. If word gets out about them being Israeli, their lives will be at stake. We knew that if we were careless, we could sink the whole operation. It was surreal to think that while we were at the resort having fun, dancing with the guests at a party, the very same night at the back of the resort, there's a convoy of trucks transporting Jews to an evacuation point. The Ethiopians are picked up at the refugee camps and taken by boat across the Red Sea to Israel. But the going is slow. The situation in the camps worsens. Mossad finds ways of secretly flying out larger groups. The nightly operations are extremely risky. Once we stumbled into a Sudanese army ambush. About 60 Sudanese soldiers suddenly emerged from the dark, armed with AK-47s. Suddenly I see Danny with his hands in the air, shouting at the officer, you're a moron, you're an idiot, I work for the tourism industry, I take tourists on nocturnal dives and you open fire on me? I'll be in Khartoum tomorrow and lodge a complaint with the chief of staff. The officer, all embarrassed, mumbled an apology, gathered his men and left. There are several clashes with Sudanese soldiers. But Mossad manages to carry out further transports by bribing the ruling dictator with considerable sums. Of course, it's all discreet and secret, so Sudan can keep face in the Arab world. <laughs> Every group of Jews that I saw pulling away from the shore with the naval commandos or going up in the plane brought with it enormous satisfaction. The people in the Mossad, they are not uh, immoral. And uh, if they have to uh, uh, choose between uh, bringing Jews from Ethiopia to Israel to killing, I don't know who, most of them would prefer to bring Jews from Ethiopia. So, yes, it was a positive uh, 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 assignment. Who are the people that risk their lives for Mossad? What inspires them? I know that part of the image of a Mossad operative is the guy with the knife in his teeth, James Bond with his fancy weaponry, Yet, the most dangerous thing would be to get caught with a weapon in a country where you're not supposed to be. So, you don't carry weapons. Your weapon is your identity, your cover story. To keep from blowing their cover, the agents almost always have to hide their Jewish identity, which might cost them their lives in enemy territory. Despite the considerable personal risk, Mossad has never had trouble recruiting agents. Its budget has increased in recent years. Its manpower expanded. Recently, cyber experts have become much sought after. Yet, right from the start, recruiters looked for a certain type of personality. You must be a reliable person with strong morals. On the other hand, you must have the ability to be someone else entirely in certain situations. However, the combination of these two qualities is hard to find. Generally, people are either honest and just, or they're crooks. That's why operatives are so hard to find. That's why only one in a thousand fits. People who fit the profile have bright career prospects. The close connections between the security sector and politics in Israel are a real door opener. And once you're in, you're in a boys and girls club, because it's boys and girls pretty much equal at the beginning, that gives you a starting salary when you go out you know, in double-digit numbers in a way that Israelis don't get, without studying at all, without having gone to university. You don't ask to be in intelligence. You're invited in. It's still viewed in Israel as being the best, the brightest, and cutting edge. When in Israel, you ask, what do you do in life? 
And you say, I work for the Prime Minister office in a low voice. They understand. Prime Minister office is the code word when you say it in a low voice, maybe smiling a bit. They know that you are from the Mossad. Even if you do accountants, you have prestige. A military coup in 1985 leads to the abrupt end of Mossad's operation in Sudan. The new leaders denounce their predecessor, al-Namiri, as a collaborator and as a Jew lover. Things get dangerous for the Israeli agents and the coastal resort is abandoned. For nearly 10 years, Mossad smuggled Ethiopian Jews to Israel. In a race against time, 4,000 people die before the agents can save them. Yet overall, the operation is a huge success for Mossad. About 20,000 Ethiopian Jews are brought to safety by 1985. However, integrating African Jews continues to be a challenge for Israel. Nineteen eighty seven. Anger boils over in Gaza, which has been occupied by Israel for over twenty years. The lack of any perspectives especially frustrates young Palestinians. It's a breeding ground for new violence, which is increasingly triggered by radical Islamic forces. The so called Intifada catches Mossad unawares. For years, its primary objective had been fighting the PLO. Therefore, Mossad agents were used to operating on foreign territory, since Palestinian leaders have found refuge in other countries. Israel increasingly resorts to ever more radical measures. In Tunis, Mossad liquidates the alleged mastermind of the uprisings. The killing of Arafat's top aide, Abu Jihad, is hailed as a success. But it gradually becomes clear it isn't the PLO in faraway Tunis that's calling the shots. It's the people on site who revolt against Israeli occupation. The longer the uprising lasts, the louder the call for a diplomatic solution. Israelis and Palestinians finally sit down together on neutral territory in Oslo, Norway. After years of killing, and for the first time, the two sides discuss possible compromises. Israel's Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin, hopes for a lasting peace. Prime Minister Rabin didn't want any involvement of the intelligence services. He and his foreign minister, Shimon Peres, felt that too often they tended to see things through their gun sights. The Mossad chiefs, however, see themselves as diplomatic players. After all, they have been actively involved in the peace treaty with Egypt. But now, they're sidetracked by their own political leaders. The head of Mossad rushed over to Rabin and told him, Sir, something's going on in Europe. Rabin's answer was, drop it, I'm aware of it. Without sharing, without telling him what was going on. Paris used to say, what do intelligence services know? What did they know about Munich? What did they know about Pearl Harbor? Therefore, he thought he could do without their advice. As a result of the Oslo talks, Israel and the PLO sign a peace treaty in Washington in 1993. Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat received the Nobel Peace Prize the following year. Israel's troops withdraw from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. From now on, both territories are under Palestinian self-government. In return, the PLO agrees to establish a security force to put an end to the assaults on Israel. Matters of dispute, like the Israeli settlements or the status of Jerusalem, are left unresolved. But Yasser Arafat no longer speaks for all Palestinians. A new radical force has gained in strength, the Islamic terror organization Hamas. Their goal, a theocracy and the destruction of Israel. 
Sheikh Ahmad Yassin founded Hamas with the outbreak of the Intifada in 1987. An Israeli court sentences him to life in prison, but that only makes Hamas stronger. After the peace accord, Israel expects the PLO to take action against Hamas's terror, since operations carried out by Israeli intelligence could endanger the peace process. The main approach was that uh, the Hamas is a problem, but as long as Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian Authority um, want to continue and see an interest in continuing the peace process, they'll take care of, of the Hamas. The problem was that at a certain stage, the Palestinian leadership decided probably to, to slow down or its, its war against against the Hamas, and, and this were where the troubles started. A fatal error. Hamas's suicide attacks stun Israel's cities. The Islamists want to undermine the peace process. Mossad has no remedy for dealing with the new threat of fanatic suicide attackers. Israel's new prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, in office since 1996, is expected by his supporters to return to a policy of strength. Men, women, and children, small children, were murdered. As prime minister, it's my responsibility to do everything in my power to fight this terrorist evil. The Prime Minister asked the leaders of the intelligence services to name persons they could target and liquidate to stop Hamas attacks. At Mossad, we worked on finding out who we could get close to. But the leaders of Hamas were in Amman, Jordan, and we couldn't get near them. We had to know where they lived, what car they drove, where they worked, what routes they took, all details that made it possible to liquidate them. For operations in Jordan, Mossad has to create a new basis first. The Secret Service have withdrawn from there to a large extent in 1994, so as not to endanger the peace treaty. Yet now, peace, once more, has given way to fighting and killing. Mossad is under pressure to deliver results in the crusade against Hamas's leaders. Mossad agents prepare a list of possible Hamas targets in Amman. However, their superiors hesitate. Benjamin Netanyahu compelled the Mossad to carry out uh, an act in Jordan, and the Mossad didn't want to do it, and Netanyahu pressured the Mossad. Sometimes, Politicians need to uh, show the public some results. Um, and then the, the, the easiest outlet is, is the Mossad or the idea of the Israeli military. Netanyahu wants to strike at the heart of Hamas. Khaled Mashal, Hamas's Politburo chief in Amman, becomes the first target. Nothing should suggest an Israeli strike. Jordan's government fears Palestinian uprisings in the refugee camps. The idea is to poison Mashal in broad daylight, but without anyone realizing it, so it will look like he died of natural causes. The unit experimented on unsuspecting people on the street. Two people approach the target from behind, one sprays him, and the other, just before, shakes and opens a cola can, causing the can's contents to spray all over. When the person who was sprayed turns around, just sees a shaken-up can of cola, he thinks that's what sprayed him. The team has little time to practice. Netanyahu wants quick results. The operation spirals out of control. 
Khaled Mashal is walking with his sons and a security guard. A Hyundai pulls up to them and two men emerge. They approach Mashal, press a device against his head and escape. Mashal collapses and his bodyguard hails a cab and begins his pursuit. After a few minutes' drive, the assassins try to switch cars. But when they get out of their car, Mashal's bodyguard attacks them and the Jordanian police arrive. Mashal is taken to the hospital in critical condition. I think there was something very positive there, but their excessive motivation led to a serious mishap. Because my briefing was, if there's anyone near Mashal, no matter who, do not act. And Mashal unexpectedly came out with his driver and two children, and our people went ahead anyway. Mashal is a mortal agony. Two Mossad agents are exposed and end up in custody. The peace agreement with Jordan hangs by a thread. Hussein said that if Mashal dies, he'll have a Palestinian uprising on his hands, and he'll have no choice but to execute our two operatives. So they decided to make a deal with Hussein. We'd save Mashal's life using the antidote, and the two captured agents would be released. Grudgingly, Israel consents to save the terrorist's life. Nevertheless, diplomatic relations with Jordan are severely disrupted. Former Mossad deputy director Ephraim Halevi is summoned. He had helped to negotiate the peace treaty. He was about the only Israeli who King Hussein of Jordan was willing to trust in trying to negotiate some form of a resolution to the crisis without a formal break in diplomatic relations and perhaps even worse, the outbreak of hostilities between Jordan and Israel. The great strategic aim of Halevi was to rescue that peace treaty with Jordan, which ultimately was worth more uh, longer term for the stability of the region, and indeed the security of Israel, than the removal of an individual from the leadership of, of, of Hamas. Israel pays a high price for peace. Hamas founder Sheikh Rassin is released from prison a concession to Jordan intended to appease the Palestinians living there. After being saved, Khaled Mashal becomes Hamas's new leader in waiting. Mossad's operation was supposed to weaken Hamas and curb the suicide attacks. The opposite occurs. In September 2000, Islamists unleashed the second intifada against Israel. The number of suicide attacks rises. Mossad, Israeli military intelligence and Shin Bet were suffering, I think, the lowest ebb of their history. They were not capable to deal with the threat. And in the words of Avi Dichter, who was the chief of the Shin Bet at that time, he said, we did not supply the citizens of Israel the shield they deserved. The Amman fiasco plunges Mossad into its biggest crisis yet. What's left of the once hard-hitting secret service? After the millennium, a new powerful adversary appears on the scene, Iran. Mossad must reset its sights. The Islamic Republic sees Israel as its sworn enemy and has been excluded from all peace-seeking efforts in the Middle East. Part of the Iranian response to being excluded and snubbed was it was back then that they started ramping up, increasing their material aid to the likes of Hamas and the Palestine Islamic Jihad. They were basically saying, okay, if we're not going to be part of this process, don't expect us to support it and don't be surprised if we undermine it. And that's basically what they did. Iran sets up a network among Israel's enemies. It maintains close contact to Bashar Assad's regime in Syria. It supports the Shiite Hezbollah militia in Lebanon with arms, money and fighters. 
Yet also the hostile Sunnite Islamists in the occupied territories receive aid from Tehran. It's a surprising alliance of convenience. Sunnites and Shiites have been separate confessions within Islam for more than a thousand years. About 15% of Muslims worldwide are Shiites, and most of them live in Iran. As for Sunnites, like the Palestinians, Shiites are adversaries. But in the fight against Israel, the confessional dispute seems insignificant. In 2002, Mayor Dagan becomes the new head of Mossad. A military man who fundamentally reforms the secret service. To him, the main adversary is Iran. Mayor Dagan was characterized as a more robust uh, director of the Mossad and was often seen as giving back teeth to the Mossad. He came in and he said, stop all the talking. We're about actions, not about talking. And he focused the Mossad for eight years, action-based, clear operations. And I think that it took the Mossad at a very critical place from being talking and suddenly becoming kind of almost soft diplomacy and behind the world, behind the scenes, into a place where they were very effective. Mossad agents, previously often deployed in long-term undercover missions, are now expected to deliver tangible results. Data are valued according to their benefit for short-term operations. Degan orders Mossad to focus on two main objectives. First, fighting the anti-Israeli network behind terrorism. Second, Iran's nuclear program. Since the late 90s, Mossad is aware of nuclear sites in Iran. Officially, they're used for civilian purposes only, yet Israel feels threatened by the destructive potential in the hands of an enemy. When Maya Dagan takes office, Mossad analysts estimate that Iran could possess nuclear weapons within a few years, a mortal danger. For decades, Israel has been fighting every nuclear ambition among its neighbors. The small country could be wiped out by just a few atomic bombs. For a long time, Israel has hushed up its own nuclear program in the Negev desert. Not until 1986 was it revealed that the reactor there had been producing weapons-grade plutonium since the 1960s. An additional secret service was specifically set up to collaborate with Mossad to obtain the data needed for Israel's bomb. To date, Israel is considered the only nuclear power in the Middle East, and Mossad does everything to keep it that way. When Iraq's dictator Saddam Hussein builds a reactor in the early 80s with French support, Mossad tries to stall the program with diplomatic pressure and sabotage. Then, Israel's government orders an airstrike. The site in eastern Iraq is severely damaged. In 2007, Mossad is startled by information about a nuclear project in Syria. Once again, the Secret Service recommends an airstrike, but this time undercover. Israel doesn't go public with it until 10 years later. The message from the 2007 attack on the reactor is that Israel will not tolerate any construction that can pose an existential threat to the state of Israel. This was the message in 1981, this is the message in 2007, and this is the future message to our enemies. However, airstrikes against neighboring countries entail high risks. In the case of Iran, Mossad warns of incalculable consequences.
Mir Dagan was the new Mossad director. I don't want to go into detail, but he was in favor of any action that would stave off the need to scramble our jets. Dagan prefers to secretly weaken Iran using unconventional alliances. Mir Dagan told me we needed to focus on the Arab world, that we needed to invest in countries that didn't have official ties with us. Many Arab countries, particularly those with a Sunnite majority, consider Iran to be as dangerous as Israel. By collaborating with Israel, they see an opportunity to ward off Iran's nuclear threat. Sharing secrets with the Arabs? Resistance is fierce within Mossad. But the new policy provides important access to Iran. Israel wants the West to join in and intensify the pressure on Tehran. To achieve this, explosive information is passed on to the Mossad's Western colleagues. There is no question that uh, the Iranian threat is not just a threat for Israel, but for the whole world. Iran is dangerous, and they'll be even more dangerous if they learn how to enrich uranium. And so I look forward to figuring out ways we can work together to prevent this from happening for the sake of world peace. Mossad's dossier on Iran also reaches the Europeans. Since I read the first reports on Iran's nuclear program in 2001, it was always a matter of three years. I don't want to downplay it. Iran's nuclear program really exists. But what's more important is their ballistic missile program. It's no use testing medium-range missiles when you have nothing to put on top. And it's not little teddy bears. So we have to decide how to react. Mossad turns to pressure, preferably with lots of players. Iran should voluntarily give up its nuclear ambitions. For that purpose, a brand new weapon is used, cyber sabotage. Limited measures that don't reveal their origin, don't provoke retaliation and don't cause escalation. I was a proponent of using these measures. It's a worm, which means it propagates by itself. It keeps moving through the system and it hides its tracks. You think that Israel did it? I mean, I'm, I'm going to guess that they will never admit it, even if they did. Stuxnet. A computer virus cripples Iran's uranium enrichment plant, presumably as a result of covert collaboration between the CIA and Mossad. In addition to the digital possibilities, Mossad also uses an age-old method. In order to stop an Egyptian missile project 40 years ago, Mossad targeted German specialists. Now, six scientists working on Iran's nuclear program are liquidated. The Iranians put so much effort into protecting the remaining scientists trying to screen the equipment being brought into the nuclear project, fearing that it is uh, polluted with bugs, with, with viruses, and screening everybody, again, fearing Mossad moves, that the Iranians themselves delayed their project, you know, putting all sorts of security and bureaucratic obstacles, they delayed their own project in two to three years. Israel buys time, and Mossad finally can boast another triumph. More than 700 kilometers of walls and fences are intended to protect Israel from the West Bank's assassins. Mossad teams attack the masterminds of Hamas's and Hezbollah's terror. The number of assassinations in Israel declines. Lebanon's Hezbollah says Israel assassinated one of its top leaders. Ahmad Marnia, one of the group's top military commanders, died in a car bombing in Syria. A high-profile success for Mossad. Mokhnia has been on Mossad's list for nearly 30 years. Targeted killings are controversial, even in Israel. It's a method that goes back to the beginnings of the Jewish underground in Palestine. 
You don't kill unrelated people, you kill your adversaries, your enemies, because by killing them you're saving the lives of others. That's the rule. Since World War II, Israel has liquidated more people than any other Western country. According to estimates, at least 2,000 people have been killed. Did it help Israel in the long run? Not really. But it forced the terrorist decision makers to reconsider their tactics. A terrorist on the run is quite different from a terrorist who isn't on the run. Intelligence organizations can be quite effective in, in combating terrorism. Um, but the problem is that they don't solve the problem. The problem is political, economic, societal, uh, cultural, education, and you have to deal with the sources of the problem. Otherwise, it will always be a war between intelligence organizations and terrorists. The strategy of targeted killings is also criticized within the intelligence services. The most Israeli most Israeli analysts I've met see it the same way. They say, sure, we're buying time. But today's Hamas fighters, or the people who fire missiles, aren't the problem. The problem is that the next generation will be even larger in numbers, more despairing, and more determined to take drastic measures. Yet it isn't Mossad's agents who decide the way terrorists will be fought, it's Israel's voters. And the majority of them is in favor of a crackdown. Israel comes from a very security background position. And that's not necessarily the frame in much of the Western world right now. Part of the challenge of today's world, and it's happened in the past before, is that most people want it to be you're either with us or you're against us. And most people aren't willing to go to the place of, I can agree with both sides. In 2010, a Mossad operation causes international outrage. Agents are filmed by security cameras while liquidating a man in Dubai. The target is a top Hamas functionary. In Israel, there's a show of solidarity for Mossad. Many people apply. Others offer their passports as a cover. The following Purim, which is our Halloween, the most popular costume was to, to have uh, tennis clothes, a gun, a shirt saying, I'm from the Mossad, and a tennis racket. Mossad and Israeli intelligence are the last cow that was not slaughtered in the Israeli public opinion. The ones who are keeping you safe, risking their own lives, are the people from the Mossad and the rest of the Israeli intelligence. A monument near Mossad's headquarters in Tel Aviv, commemorating the men and women who have fallen in the line of duty. Casualties of a war that will never end? In 2012, the nuclear dispute with Iran comes to a head. Mossad's operations have only slowed down the program. They haven't stopped it. Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister once again, loses his temper. Speaking at the UN, he demands radical measures against Iran. No one appreciates our intelligence agencies more than the Prime Minister of Israel. They've saved many lives, but they are not foolproof. Ladies and gentlemen, the relevant question is not when Iran will get the bomb, the relevant question is, at what stage can we no longer stop Iran from getting the bomb? A red line should be drawn right here. 
he was ready, he was willing to go to war against Iran. There is something fetishistic in Netanyahu's mind about the Iranian nuclear project, and we pay, we pay a price for this because it turns Israel into Iran's main target in the Middle East, and we shouldn't be Iran's mid, main, main target. They, they can have other targets. They don't need us. The intelligence services use their influence to prevent an airstrike. The strategy seems to pay off. In 2015, Iran signed an agreement. The United States has achieved a comprehensive long-term deal with Iran that will prevent it from obtaining a nuclear weapon. When you eventually realize what you're dealing with and that you have increasing power to decide things, you grasp that you have a crucial influence on events. And then you can stop really terrible things from happening. But hope only lasts for a short while. In 2018, Mossad agents get hold of secret documents, alleged proof of forbidden nuclear activities in Iran. Prime Minister Netanyahu makes them public. Another 55. Iran lied. U.S. President Donald Trump terminates the nuclear agreement with Iran. The time for talks in the Middle East is over. I think that the main problem with the Mossad and the successes of the Mossad is that they help policymakers solve, solve problems and therefore they allow the policymakers to avoid going through more fundamental solutions to the problem. Warmonger and peacemaker. Mossad has been both throughout its existence and its brief to protect Israel won't be any easier in the future. <laughs>